We want to ask you to stand with us this morning. Praises rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. are yearning for you we long for you cause when we see you we find strength to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Hosanna Us, worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Turning to you, we turn to you. In your kingdom, broken lives are made new. You make us new. Cause when we see you, we find strength. Face the day in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away, Sing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praise. Here we go. I know it's a new song. Here we go. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. We'll sing that again. Here we go. Cause when we see you, see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Sing it out, Hosanna. 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 You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. Jesus. 
the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul. Worship your Sun comes up. Here we go. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when they hear. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. Your rich in love and your slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship Your holy name. Oh, Lord, I worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. 
So uh, this morning when we were in, uh, in, in my small group, um, I was kind of challenged. I was kind of challenged to slow myself down a little bit. Uh, because I, I always want to fill time with talking. And we were talking about prayer today in, in small group at the beginning. And, and, uh, and we were just talking about how you're, you're before the creator of the universe. And a lot of times we just kind of dive right into that. We just start praying before we actually know what we're, who we're talking to or what we're, what we're going to say. And I think sometimes it's appropriate to just, to just take a moment and say, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Because it's, we're not going to get it. We're not going to fathom all that the Lord is. And so I think right, right now we just need to take a moment. And let's, let's just go ahead and, and, um, and bow, bow your heads if you'd like to. And try, try your best to, to just get alone with the Lord for a moment. Focus on the fact that He is holy. Focus on the truth that He created the universe, that He created you. We'll just get silent before the Lord. Father, creator of the universe, of the stars and the moon and the earth, creator of every person in this room, the power that holds all things together, things that we see and things that we don't. don't understand we can't fathom all that you are but Father we thank you for the communion that we have with you the three in one Father we love you it's in your name that we pray Amen y'all may be seated we're going to continue to worship uh, here in baptism morning church I'm Dale William This is William. He, uh, he gave his life to the Lord on the ski trip on Monday as a divine, divine appointment. Yes. <laughs> it was the last time to go down the slopes. And here comes William down the mountain. It's just me and him standing there. And I feel the Lord tell me to share with William about the Lord and his love for us and the gospel. And I drew it out in the snow for him. And he gave his life to the Lord that night. And we're here today as an outward expression of what he's done on the inside. And I'd like to ask friends and family to stand up, if you will, to support William today in this. And William, as you see these people standing, they will stand with you and walk with you even in your failures. And we will be the church for you. So you never forget that, okay? Has there ever been a time in your life, William, that you've repented and placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Upon that profession of faith, my brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Him in His death, raised to walk in the news of life. Woo! Woo! Take this time and, we're going to take this time and shake hands and greet one another and fellowship.
the humble and raise them high You choose the weak and make them strong You heal our brokenness inside And give us life The same love that set the captives free The same love that opened eyes to see Is calling the soul by name Spread the heavens wide The same God that was crucified Is calling the soul by name You are calling the soul by name You take the faithless ones aside And speak the words You are mine for the cynic and the proud Come to me now The same love that set the captives free The same love that opened eyes to see Is calling your soul by name You are calling your soul by name The same God that spread the heavens the same God that was crucified is calling the soul by name. You are calling the soul by name. my feet you are my sword and shield 
Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know, I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side Nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hand. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the god of angel armies is always by my side i know who goes before me i know who stands behind the god of angel armies is always by my side Is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you knowing that you are strong, that there is power in your name. And that is why we come, Father. For the redemption that came through the cross of Christ and the blood that saved our souls. Father, it is in your name that we pray and in your name that we sing. Amen. Y'all may be seated.
Let me tell you about a group that's all in this morning. Those that are involved in upward basketball here at Emmanuel. We just had a great day of upward basketball yesterday. Many of you are involved in it. In fact, if you are, would you stand up if you're a player or a coach uh, or involved in concessions, uh, ref, scoreboard? All right, Abigail, yeah, that's you. Yeah, she's on my team. She won't even stand up. It's probably about her coach. But uh, give these guys a hand. Y'all, y'all may be seated. And, and uh, they, they work so hard, and they're impacting lives. They're, every week, kids are memorizing Scripture. They're coming to basketball practice. They're doing a devotion during their basketball practice. And then at halftime, uh, they, they get a message. And just, man, it's impacting lives, and it's great to partner with Central Baptist and so many other churches with upper basketball. So thank you for your work. Those guys are all in. Uh, they put a lot, a lot of time in today. Today... Uh, we're in our last message in the sermon series, All In. Today's title is called The Stand. And actually, out of this message, we're going to begin our next message on spiritual warfare. And the, the title of that series is just simply entitled The Stand. It may be in homage of Stephen King, I'm not for sure. Um, but that, in some ways, will begin today in this message. When I was a campus minister... At EKU, I was young, just out of college, first into ministry, my first position as a campus pastor on the campus of Eastern Kentucky University. I experienced something that that was very unique uh, to to me, even to to this day. A student began coming to our fellowship there in Eastern Kentucky, and and she was a very likable person, a very sweet person. Uh, She had an above-average knowledge of the Scriptures, and she quickly got involved in our fellowship there in Richmond, at EKU. She got involved. It wasn't too long after that she began dating one of the leaders, uh, student leaders in our group in our varsity Christian fellowship. It wasn't long after they began dating, uh, me and the other campus pastor honestly felt like the relationship got unhealthy real quick and, and way, way too quick. Well, those, those fears became a reality uh, when this young lady, all of a sudden, she just kind of vanished. We, she went from being very active in our chapter, even beginning to uh, help and volunteer in certain aspects, so we just didn't see her. And then after a period of time, then we saw her on campus, and we would call her name, we'd wave to her, and she'd totally ignore us. I'm not just, you know, wasn't from a distance, she saw, you know, we were apart, and so she didn't see us, so she didn't wave. No, I'm talking, we would pass each other, shoulder to shoulder, you'd stop, you'd tell her, uh, her, you'd call out her name, and she would totally ignore you and walk past you. And I thought, man, what did we do? You know, what, what, what did we do? How, how was this uh, relationship affected? Well, it wasn't long after that. We also realized that she became very uh, promiscuous in her lifestyle. She, this one sweet girl began to have fits of rage, followed by a, a canatotic state where she was just almost in a trance. We continued to counsel this young girl and um, brought in a professional counselor as well, a friend of, of my co-workers, and she was diagnosed with multiple personality disorder. Well, obviously, we were very concerned uh, about this young lady on the campus of Eastern Kentucky University who's involved in our fellowship, so we read all we could. If we were going to counsel her, we realized we were far out of our league. I mean, you can imagine as a you know, 24-year-old trying to figure out multiple personality disorder and and how you counsel somebody from the Word of God. And so we just, we read everything we could get our hands on. And one thing I learned that often those with multiple personality disorder come from families whose parents were involved in the occult uh, on a deep level uh, and, and worship in the occult. And more times than not, nine out of ten times, if not a hundred percent, there was also child sexual abuse involved in the situation. And, and then it's out of that, oftentimes you see demonic possession in those with multiple personality disorder. Well, each person in her had a different name. We never knew who we were talking to. We never knew how she was going to react or how she was going to respond. The doctors that she went to had no answers. But we continued to pray and we continued to lift her up to the Lord and continued to direct her back to the Word of God. And she began to go to church and it was was a church that, that, uh, that she was prayed for and delivered, so it seems, from multiple personality disorder. Uh, we, we don't know exactly uh, what all happened, uh, but we're thankful for that. She was then married sometime later and had kids, and as far as I know to this day, lives a, a fully functioning life, healthy life as a mom and as a, and as a wife, and has been delivered from that demonic influence. 
One thing that was extremely interesting to me in my readings that impacts me still to this day is I was reading about these experts, these believers around the country that uh, have a lot of experience in this area. Something they said stood out to me. They said this. They said that you and I as believers, uh, we believe that 80% of our existence is physical, meaning we can touch it. 80% of all reality is concrete. It's this speaker. It's I can see you, I can see me, I can see the walls, uh, I see different things in this room, and that's 80% of our reality. And we believe 20% of our reality is spiritual, those things we cannot see, the supernatural, those things around us. And then he flipped it around, but he said this. He said, but those involved in the occult and and those uh, types of uh, environments, it's totally the opposite. They believe of what you can see, what is concrete, is 20%, but what is spiritual is 80%. I believe they're closer to the truth than what we are in our worldview. And I think it's a ploy of the evil one for us to begin to think that, well, you know, that's just something in olden days. That's something, that's a fable. That's something they wrote about before scientific discovery. And so we bought into that lie of Satan, and we don't realize that right now, this very moment, guys, there is spiritual activity happening all around us. That there's a battle that's raging right now over your heart, your, your soul, your attention, and your understanding. The demons and angels are, are literally clashing at this very moment. And that there's a battle that rages all around us, not only in this room, over your life, over the city, over the state, over this country, and over this world. In our area, spiritual battle is, is more intense, spiritual warfare is more intense in our region than any other place I've ever seen. Broken marriages, drug addiction, and the amount of churches in our area that are making little to no impact. And this, this has been valid, this was my conclusion after being here a year. Knowing all the past and studying a little bit about our area, uh, being my wife being from eastern Kentucky, understanding a little bit more of of it from her perspective. But then when I began to talk to pastors in our area, and without any prompting from me, older pastors, Alan, I I just want to warn you, that the spiritual battle here is thick. It's thicker than anywhere I've been. Pastors that have served other states, other regions, and now that that they're here, they say, Alan, the battle is real, and it is intense. And so at some, some level today, what I want you to understand is that the battle is real around us. And it's intense here in our area, even more so than many other areas. So today, I want to challenge you to stand. Today, I challenge you to stand on Christ as your strength and fight the battle. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Daniel, Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 we see part of what this looks like. We see what it looks like to stand. We've been in Daniel through this All In series, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, we're going to read the entire chapter, so it's, it's lengthy. We're going to read a section, and then I'm going to back out, and then we're going to get back in, and we're going to read the rest of it. So go ahead and, and find on your smartphones or turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 10, page 794. Yeah. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was also called Belshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. Verse 2, At that time I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. Our fast. Today is, we break the fast after church day right at lunch for those that have been fasting for three weeks today's our final day and this is why verse four on the 24th day of the first month as i was standing on the bank of the great tiger the river the tigris i looked up and there before me was a man listen carefully dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist his body was like crystal light his face like lightning his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of multitudes. Now, before we go any further, let's stop there because you need to know who this person is. This person is Jesus Christ. Now, the person here that Daniel comes in contact with 
is Christ before he was born in Bethlehem. It is the pre-existent Christ. In theological terms, we call this a Christophany, an appearance of Christ before the New Testament. Well, how can you say that with such confidence? One reason, at the bottom of your outline on the screen, you'll see in Revelation chapter 1, John sees Jesus. This is the end of our Bible. He says, he writes, Among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down. Now listen, look, as we read this passage, notice how close of description it is to what Daniel says. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. What did Daniel say it was like? Like the sound of a multitude. In his right hand he held seven swords, and out of his mouth came a double-edged sword. His face was like the shining and all of its brilliance. And so if you read before and after that text in the book of Revelation, we learn that this is the I Am, the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord Jesus Christ in this description. So it matches almost verbatim what we have in Daniel. Now, Alan, why isn't exactly every single word the same? Well, understand as you look in the text, just literary-wise, he uses the word like, right? He's, he's using um, uh, similes here. He's, he's using metaphors. You know, the, the like here, he says it's like. Because when Daniel saw Jesus, he had never seen him before. And when he saw Jesus, not only had he never seen him before, he had never seen anything like him. So he's looking at Jesus Christ, the God, the creator of the universe, and he says, I'm going to try to explain this. But my words are not adequate to describe to you and help visualize what he looks like. So it was like this. It was like crystal light. His voice was like the sound of multitudes. His feet were like burnished bronze. And that's exactly what John does in Revelation chapter 1. When John sees Jesus, he had never seen Christ completely glorified in his holy body in this sense. And so he, he sees him and in, in the full deity of Christ... He had shed his manhood, and you're looking at God, completely God, in Christ Jesus, and John says, this is what it's like. And so when you compare Daniel's description to John's description, it's almost verbatim. So it's critical as we begin back in verse 7 to understand this person for which Daniel is before is the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself. Verse 7, I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face was turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. Verse 10. A hand touched me and sent me trembling, my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you. And stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me. Twenty-one days. Then Michael, one of the chief princesses, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. That's Michael the archangel. Verse 14. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns the time yet to come. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. So now he's no longer standing again. But he's bowed down on the ground, face to the ground, and he's speechless. Verse 16. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips. And I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I am helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. Verse 20. So he said, Do you not know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. 
And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. May God bless the reading of his word. I'd like you to turn to the back of your outline, uh, back of your bullets, and you'll find an outline. Let's just jump into this. Number one, I want you to know that your adversary is real. Your adversary is real. In verse 12, Jesus says to him, from the first day, the fast was 21 day fast, from the first day that you set your mind to gain knowledge and humble yourself before me, for 21 days, Jesus was detained by demonic force. From the prince of Persia, we understand in scripture the prince or king is oftentimes talking about angels, whether it's angels like Michael or a fallen angel like the prince of Persia, like Lucifer. So for 21 days, there is a reality that demonic forces detained Jesus. He was coming to him, but for some reason he couldn't go straight there because there was a battle that took place. He was occupied, the Bible says. In verse 1 of chapter 11, which we read, he says, in the first year of King Darius. So he, he, he backs up a little bit, and he says, no one supports me except Michael, your prince. In the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Talking about Michael. So the demons were fighting against the angel, Michael. And he needed backup. So Jesus comes in the first year of Darius the king, and he fights, he helps Michael. He fights against the demonic forces. So we can begin to put a timeline together. This lasted for four to five years. Some of us, hey, I don't have to convince you of the reality of the war. Many of us, we limp in here today with wounds of the battle. Marriages that are scarred from the battle. There are those here that are struggling with drug dependency. And you had temptations around every corner. That person that you know you don't even need to talk to, it seemed like everywhere you went, whether it was Kroger or post office, they were there. Maybe it's physical. I, you understand. You understand the reality of the battle, that, that it is very, very real. Well, I must tell you that it could go on for years. Here we see in this battle, the Lord Jesus Christ fighting a demonic force for four to five years. If you would back up, you don't have to, but in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, the Bible says, in the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes. And Daniel goes on and he begins to say that he looked in the book of Jeremiah, and in the book of Jeremiah it said in 70 years, uh, we're going to be released from Babylon, which now they're in captivity in, in chapter 10 still. And so he reads in Jeremiah that in 70 years they're going to be set free. And he says, man, it's been 70 years, we're going to be set free. At the very moment, now get this, in chapter 9, at the very moment that Daniel saw the promise in the Word of God in the book of Jeremiah that his people would be set free, a battle started. And the prince of Persia came to put down the people of God, to say, no, God's promises are not true. No, you won't be delivered. No, you're still in captivity. And at that point, Michael the archangel was dispatched to fight against the enemy and his strategy and his schemes who like to speak lies into the people of God, that you can't be delivered, that you're still in captivity. So this battle took place for many years, and friends, yours could as well. Let me give you just a few things that we see in this passage about our adversary and how real the adversary is. First, we see that they work against our prayers and our efforts. And these demons were working against the prayers of Daniel in chapter 9. And then in chapter 10, as he was fasting and praying and asking God for deliverance, asking God to come through in power and to set his people free, they came and they fought. So know this, the devil will work against your prayers and your efforts. He will work against this church. You believe that, don't you? You believe he's working against your family, he's working against your church, and he's working against the purposes of God in this generation. And he does a good job. Number two, they, they hinder the work of... Not only do they work against your prayers, but they hinder the work of God. It says, for 
Daniel prayed. And Jesus was detained. The angels were detained. The work of God was hindered. Number three, they battle. Jesus battles against these demonic forces. Number four, angels battle against these demonic forces. Alan, how did this all begin? In a couple days, we're going to go over this thoroughly, but let me give you kind of the nutshell version here. There were three archangels. There's Michael, there's Gabriel, and there's Lucifer. And they were over a third each of all angels. Lucifer and pride that you and I called Satan fell because of his pride and he was kicked out of heaven. And the Bible says he took a third of the heavenly host with him. These are what we call fallen angels or what we more commonly call demons. So the, the other two thirds, and we don't know how many there are. Uh, some say the, the amount of total angels uh, equals the amount of stars in the heavens. Because angels are often referred to as stars. And it would be quite poetic and something that God would possibly do. Now you and I know that we've never been able to count all the stars in the cosmos. So there's a lot of angels. There's multitudes upon multitudes we read about in Revelation. Thousands upon thousands. So what does that tell us? If, if one third of the thousands upon thousands, if one third of, of the stars in the heaven, which you and I don't even know the total number of, fell, that's the number of demons that run through this earth. Now some are in captivity and, until judgment. We read about them in Genesis 5 and in the book of Jude and then again in the book of Revelation. But we know most of these demons run loose into our lives and in our world. Trying to trip you up. Trying to destroy you. Trying to overcome you. Trying to fool you. Trying to trick you. To destroy your life and everything that God's trying to do in your life. Demons are very organized. They're not haphazard. Uh, the Bible says that Lucifer was the most beautiful of all of God's creations. I interpret that, as do others, that he had the highest intellect. Now, Lucifer is small, far smarter than anything you and I could ever imagine or, or even put together. You could put this whole room together. And Lucifer is far more intelligent than we are. And he's organized this band of demons, these fallen angels, which can't even be counted. They're so, such a large number. And they've been doing it for a long time. You and I, we've not been born for very long. But they've been doing it for thousands of years. Here in, in Daniel, we see that, that they're organized even by territories. We read a, about two such demons. There's, there's the Persian king and there's the, the Grecian prince or the Greek, the prince of Greece that come. And so there's certain areas. And, and so we know that they, they can move at great, uh, great speeds and time uh, is nothing to them. Uh, but so what does that tell us? That tells us that uh, we, we can't necessarily say 100%. But we know that there's, there's demons that have a... That they're, they're over, they have responsibilities over the city. You understand that? that? There are demons that have responsibilities over your life and your family. And He has sent them to destroy you. To destroy this town and to destroy the city. Perhaps it's demons that are over the state of Kentucky. And they're doing certain things. They're, they're very organized. They, they're assigned over territories. They have names assigned to them. And they go as they're directed. And they have the same mission. And it's to destroy you. It's to bring you down. It's, it's to make people think that God doesn't exist. That God's something of yesterday. Their goal is to make you think they don't exist. A great book to read on this is C.S. Lewis' Screw Tape Letters. Man, it's a great work. He talks at length at this. The devil and his band of demons organized over certain areas. The Bible tells us in Ephesians and other places that they have schemes and they have strategies. So not only are they organized, not only are they extremely bright, not only do they know what trips you up, understand, they're observing what's going on right here, right now. They're not on the sideline. They don't sleep, they don't rest. No, they have a strategy, and the Bible says they have schemes. And they're carrying them out in your lives today, this morning, and they will this week. And we'll talk about those in the weeks to come. Because it's important to understand what their schemes and strategies are, and we might overcome them through the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of His, His testimony. Well, tell us a little bit more about 
this enemy that is real. First, we see they have incredible strength. In Mark chapter 5, they broke chains. In Acts chapter 19, the sons of Sceva learned how powerful they are. The sons of Sceva went, and as they went uh, to this man who was demon-possessed, they tried to cast the demons out. The demon said, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but you I don't know. And this one man jumped on all seven of these men. And the Bible says all seven of these men left beaten, bleeding, and naked. One man, fully demon-possessed, overcame seven men, and not only whooped them, stripped them naked. It's like he wouldn't let them leave the house. I mean, how crazy is that? Wouldn't let them leave the house to every stitch of clothes was off of them and they were beaten and bleeding. This ain't Old Testament. This is New Testament. This is after the resurrection. This is in the book of Acts. Not only incredibly strong, but they have power over physical disease. They can bring physical disease upon your life. The dumb man in Matthew 9, 32. Uh, the blind man in Matthew 12, verse 22. In the Old Testament, Job... Uh, the, the devil and the demons brought sores on him so bad he scraped them and he it was so painful he wished he could die. Incredible strength, physical disease, and also division in the church. 2 Corinthians 2.11, the Bible tells us, Paul speaking, he says, show forgiveness in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Satan desires to bring disunity to the church. And, and finally, his power to bring temptation because he knows what allures us. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 on your outline, the Bible says, For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, but Paul did again and again, but Satan stopped us. The Apostle Paul, perhaps the greatest preacher, missionary in the history of the world, was stopped by Satan. He wanted to come to them, but he could not because Satan stopped him. So that's kind of a wake-up call. If Satan can stop Paul, why do you think he can't stop you? Why do you think he's not stopping you from being all that you can in Christ? From putting those thoughts in your mind? Discouragement. You know, one way I see it all the time is when people get out of coming to church. They're, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. All of a sudden they're coming. There's a distraction. A lot of times it's a good thing. I mean, it can be sports, it can be a job, it can be so many things that aren't bad. But then Satan gets in there and starts whispering lies, and you don't have time, and all of a sudden you're too tired. All of a sudden it's not a priority. All of a sudden you're meeting other people that don't go to church. And all of a sudden you're not coming to church, and you're forsaking the assembly of the brethren together on the Lord's day. All of a sudden you're no longer being fed by the Word, you're being fed by an opposing force. Number two, and very encouraging... Your prayers are more powerful than you know. Verse 12, Jesus continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding to humble yourself before God. Your words were heard. Friend, you need to understand that your prayers are more powerful than you think. Your prayers can change the fate of nations. You can literally shake heaven and earth through your prayers. Not because you're powerful, but as a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. And the Bible says here, since the very first day, not after 21 days of prayer and fasting, but from the first day, Jesus said to Daniel, I heard your prayers. From the first day you began to seek knowledge and humble yourself before me. Your prayers are heard from God. And God responds to your prayers. Not because you're so good. Not because you're so spiritual. No, but because He is. And He's almighty. And He will come. God responds to our prayers. God sends angels in response to your prayers. What, what did Daniel do here in the passage? Just real simply, because I want you to know that you're well equipped to take your stand. That your prayers impact this world. They impact your life. They fight against the evil one. They fight against the demonic forces that are trying to control you even at this very second. What did he do? First, he sought God. Jesus said, from the first day you began to seek knowledge and come to me. 
We need to seek the Lord. It needs to be first on your list. Secondly, it says, the Bible says, he humbled himself. The Bible tells us, now this is a kingdom principle, you need to understand this, that God gives grace to the humble. But he opposes the proud. You know, some of you, me, we have struggles against pride. You need to understand that humbleness is the key that unlocks the door to God's blessing, God's protection, God's mercy, and God's grace. But he will oppose the proud. He will come against those that are prideful. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the Bible says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The person sitting to your left, the person sitting to your right is not your enemy. I want you to look to him right now and just say, you're not my enemy. Look to your left, look to your right, you have to look behind you. You're not my enemy. Paul says, our enemy is not flesh and blood. But what does he say our enemy is? Rulers. And now these are all demonic forces. These are all synonyms for the demonic, for fallen angels. Against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We have a battle. We need to take our stand. We need to take our stand against the enemy. Ephesians 6.10, the Bible says, and this is not on your outline. You can write it down. You need to read it. Ephesians 6.10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Why is churches not, our churches not growing like they should? Why is there so much discouragement? Why is there so much lack of joy? Why are so many marriages being uh, upheavaled? Why is there so much addiction? It's because we're not taking our stand. It's because you're not wielding the weapons that God has given us to fight the battle and to stand. The, the walls that we put up have been crushed and no one stands guard. And the enemy runs freely in our homes and in our churches and our cities and in our states. You know, our churches that are in the middle of a war that is far more real than anything that's happening in the Middle East or any war that has ever taken place and has far greater consequences because this war has eternal consequences. And our churches could be described as Switzerland (laughs) remaining neutral and not engaging in the war, not engaging in the battle. We're sidelined while important battles rages. Brothers and sisters, casualties to the war, and we don't take our stand. Well, today that needs to change. It is time for you to take your stand against the enemy. It is time for you to take your stand against his schemes and strategies in your life. Number three, and be encouraged. Your advocate will fight for you. In 12b, as Jesus is talking to him about his prayer, he says, and I have come in response to them. Jesus will fight for you. He comes and he stands for you. And he fights for you. The king of Persia resisted him, is what the Bible says. It means uh, to withstand, or it means to stand against. So it's kind of interesting as you look through chapter 10. Daniel, first of all, he's standing on the bank of the Tigris River. Jesus comes to him and he can stand no more. Jesus says, stand. So he he stands trembling. And now here in verse 12 and verse 13, the prince of Persia resisted, or a better translation, NASB, he stands against him. He resists him. He will stand against us. And it continues to go through the text. No one stands with me but Michael. And then chapter 11, verse 1, I will stand and support and protect Michael. Chapter 10 is about taking a stand, but you need to know that you don't stand alone. That Christ will fight for you. He will defend you. And verse 20, Jesus went to fight against the prince of Persia. In 21, the Bible says, Jesus supports and he stands. In verse 1 of chapter 11, Jesus says, I took my stand to strengthen him. It means to support. It means to be a refuge. It means to be a protection. 
So when Jesus says, here in this verse, that he comes to stand, that he comes to support, what he's using here is, is a military term. He's using the term of a refuge or a fortress. We have a hymn called, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. That's the thought. That he is a fortress that protects us. Uh, perhaps you remember uh, in history, Colonel Custer. He was called the last stand when he died. Goliath, when Goliath came out to fight the armies of the living God, he took his stand. It's a military term that means that you draw a line in the sand and you say, I will not cross that, or if you cross that, it's on. Jesus declares, and he tells you like he told Daniel to stand. But know that when you stand, he stands with you. You continue here in the text, we see a great paradox. With the devil, we're told to stand. But with Christ, we are not. We bow before him. Verse 7 through 11, Daniel said, I was in terror. I was overwhelmed. Uh, they fled. The other people with him hid. Daniel says of, his, of himself, I had no strength left. I was helpless. I fell to the ground. I was trembling. Verse 15, he says that, that he bowed speechless. He said he was overcome with anguish. He was helpless. See, with the de enemy, we stand. But with Christ, we bow. We come in, and, and as you come before God, He's so holy and He's so righteous, you can't help but do that. Verse 11, He commands Daniel to stand. Why, in verse 11, why can Daniel stand? Because he says, I have been sent to you. Now stand. Verse 18, the Bible says that, that he gave him strength. And it goes on to say, Jesus cheered him on. That's an encouraging word. Jesus cheers you on today. And he says, be strong now, be strong. Verse 19, he says, I was strengthened. So verse 18, Jesus says, be strong. Verse 19, Daniel says, I was strengthened. So I declare to you today, be strong. I declare to you today, stand. And as you do on Jesus Christ, you will stand and you will be strong. But friend, you must stand. You must stand against the enemy. You must identify his lies in your life. And you must stand on the promises of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. The Bible tells us, it's not on your outline. Then he will say to those on his left, Jesus talking, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his enemies. The devil and his angels, excuse me. So Jesus says that ultimately these demonic forces will be judged. And not only will be judged, but Jesus tells us that we can stand on this promise that hell was not made for you. Hell was not made for me. Hell was made for the demons and the devil. The Bible says in 1 Peter that God's desire is that none would perish. Hell was not made for you, friend. Hell was not made for any lost person that has ever died or any lost person who dies without Jesus. It was made for the demons and Satan himself. And yet the sad reality is all those who die without Christ will go to that place that was prepared for the devil and all of his legion of angels that have fallen with him. I want you to know today that some of you need to take a stand. You need to take a stand for Christ today. Some of us have been playing games and you've heard the story of the gospel that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God created us and He has authority over our lives and we are in utter rebellion against Him. But Jesus loved us so much that He went to the cross for our sins and He died for our sins that we might have eternal life in Him. And today you need to stand for Jesus Christ. You need to take a stand and give your life to Him today. Others of you, you need to stand for your marriage today. You need to stand and you need to fight for your marriage. Others of you need to stand against that addiction that keeps you in bondage. Some of you need to stand today against gossip and slander. You look, I don't know how the enemy is attacking you, but what I do know, he is attacking you. 
And I invite you today to stand against it in Jesus' name. And as we literally stand right now, I want to pray for us. Lord Jesus, God, we pray that you would have your way in this service. God, we know that, God, you've been preparing for this day. And yet, God, we know that Satan has as well. God, we know that people are distracted today. People are tired today. People are sick today. And God, we know it's no coincidence. So God, we ask in the wonderful name of Jesus that you would anoint this time. That your spirit would fall in this place. God, that you would set people free who had captive to sin. In bondage to sin. That you would heal marriages. That you would restore relationships. God, that you would heal the sick. And that you would give sight to the blind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As counselors come, I invite you to come and take your stand for Jesus today. Some of you have been discouraged by joining the church for whatever reason. Some of you need to stand today and say, no, I know. I know this is where I need to be. And I'm going to fight with them. I'm going to stand with them as a church. Where's the discouragement in your life? That's Satan. Where's the fear in your life? That's Satan. You come. And give it to God today. You make your stand. My hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my soul, this cornerstone, this solid ground. Flood through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still and striving cease, my comfort is my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. The Lord who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless day, this guilt of life and righteousness, swore by the ones he came to save, to hold that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God. Was satisfied for every sin. One hill was laid here in the death of Christ. the 
not left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Your blood speaks by your word. When all the empty claims God calling you, God is speaking to you, come. Speaks righteousness for me. One last line of the song. God's calling you, come. Jesus, it's your blood. Sing that again, your blood. Your blood speaks a better word. And all the empty claims. Heard upon this earth speaks righteousness for me. Stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. What you want? Yeah. What can wash away our sin? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can wash us pure as snow? Welcome, dazzled friends of God. It's nothing but your blood. There's nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Your cross, your cross, it testifies your grace. It tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. Now boldly we approach, not an earthly confidence. It's only by your blood. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? It's nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood on Jesus. What can wash us your eyes to stars? Welcome to us, Lord, friends of God. Nothing but your blood. There's nothing but your blood in Jesus. that have made decisions to stand with us today and, and uh, those that prayed with these are going to give those. And Man, we're excited today. Here we have uh, Brian and, and Tara Engel. And man, we're excited uh, about what God's doing in your life. And uh, They've been worshiping with us for 
quite a while now. And so originally from the area and, and moved back. And uh, they've been saved and baptized. And I believe God's calling them to be a part of this fellowship here at Emmanuel. And uh, so as a church, if you'll covenant. He's probably going to be a preacher. That's what, Yeah, look up that. It is. Look, he's, he's up there. I love it. It's awesome. And so two, two beautiful kids, they come. Church, as they come today, uh, saying that God's called them here and, and just believing that God's going to use them here. Would you make a covenant to love and encourage and challenge them as they do us? Would you say amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And uh, uh, Dylan's coming forward today. And Dylan comes and two of his buddies who have already been saved and baptized. These guys are the uh, three musketeers up here and they've come. And, and Dylan accepted Christ. And, and uh, really it's been a few weeks ago uh, now. And his parents have been working with him. And, and uh, also uh, Jenny Lou and Brent went by and visited with them. And God's just been at work. And he has a tender heart towards the Lord. It's very obvious, and so he, he seeks to be baptized, so we'll be talking with his parents uh, uh, more about that, and so rejoice with me. All right, so amen, 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 and, uh, and Cassidy, Cassidy Smith comes today, and, and excited to let you know that she told her mom, she said, uh, God, mom's calling me today, give my life to him, and so today she comes, giving her life to Christ, and seeking the Lord in baptism. Tino? Oh, we need a mic. We don't have a mic. I can, I can be loud okay, go ahead. <laughs> no. So here we have uh, Aubrey. Aubrey has been in uh, fellowship with us for about a month or two, right? I uh, had the opportunity to have him over last night in my house. Uh, actually, you know, I, God works in very, very unique ways. Um, Ruben told me, hey, listen, you know, it's okay uh, for Aubrey and his friend to come over and spend the night in our house. And to be honest with you all, uh, it's the first time we have someone staying overnight in my house. And, uh, yeah, and uh, that's, how, that's how tough we are with Ruben. But anyhow, that's a different story. So, so uh, they were at home, and we have a breakfast this morning, and I, I just had to take that opportunity of being bold, you know, and say, hey, Aubrey, listen, where you are and where, you, where, where are you in your relationship with Christ? He said, well, you know, so-and-so. What do you mean so-and-so? He said, well, uh, do you, I ask him, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he gave his life for you? And say yes. So I looked at him, so what's stopping you from, you know, taking that profession of faith? And he said, well, I don't have it all together yet. And I said, listen, buddy, check this out. I don't have it all together either. Okay? That's why, that's why Christ died on the cross, because, because that's what you need. Someone to help you have that communication, direct access to the Lord, to, to, to God. And that's why you need to confess that Jesus is your Savior. So that's what he did today, and he accepted the Lord today in this house. So, um, and also he want to be baptized as well, okay? So he want to follow with baptism. So that's Aubrey right here. Amen. Awesome. Praise the Lord. I've been asking Megan how to pronounce her name. It's Megan Humfleet. She has given her life to the Lord today. We read from Romans 10, 9, if you confess Amen. your mouth. Yes. Amen. And that's exactly what she did. There's been a lot of people working with her. So this is Megan. And uh, excited about that. And this is Jay. Jay came up broken today. And we talked about the difference between re rededication and salvation. And she made it very, very clear that she has given her life to the Lord today for the very first time in the, in the real sense. So. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you guys to have a seat up front and at the conclusion of the service, if you would stand back up here and, and give the church family, give you guys the opportunity to come up and greet them. And thank you. I want to mention a couple things here before we take up our offering. If you would take out your bulletin and there's a communication card. If you're a guest, we ask that be your only offering today. Fill that out with your information. If, if you did not, um, last week put your... Excuse me, put your email on there. You made a decision today. You gave your life to Christ. You need prayer. There's a place you can indicate that on the bullets. And so go ahead and take just a second. Rip that communication card out and fill it out. Uh, maybe you're, you need to join the church. You need to be baptized with these. They're going to be baptized. We already have several baptisms scheduled over the next couple weeks. And you need to join them in that. As, um, as we transition to our announcements, I'm going to say a couple things before our ushers come up. Uh, one, as you exit today, our deacons, for all six, if you're sixth grade and up, and if, then after we have, if we have leftover, maybe you can get one too. But sixth grade and up, 
we have these all-in chips. As we finish this series that God gave me, we, we're just believing that this is going to be the bedrock for what God's going to do this year, and He's going to absolutely amaze us. People are going to be saved. Lives are going to be changed. Uh, man, the building projects are going to happen this year. This campus, this time next year, is going to look totally different. Our 30 acres, just, man, it, and, and these say on them, 2013 Emmanuel, all in. So our deacons are going to be standing at the back in buckets and with buckets, and you can pick those up. Or if you're a first-time guest, after you get your all-in chip, go to the back corner of my left, and first or second-time visitors, we have a packet of information that you can get. So as, as we springboard off today's message, let's go ahead and show a video now of the series that will begin next week, just as a little bit of a teaser. And I'm going to ask ushers to come forward and begin taking up the offering. Look forward to this series entitled The Stand on Spiritual Warfare over the next three weeks. A couple announcements I want to uh, kind of run through. Tonight at 5.30, we're going to do something special in our adult Bible study that meets in here. We're going to have communion tonight. So I encourage you to come back tonight. I'm in the middle of a series, uh, the, the most important week in the history of the world, the last seven days of the life of Christ and His earthly ministry. And so tonight as we look at His Last Supper, we're going to celebrate communion. So it'll be a special time. I encourage you to bring your families out. The children can go on their activities, students to theirs, and they'll also uh, have just a great experience tonight. So join us tonight at 5.30 uh, for that. And I also want to mention, uh, man, somebody grabbed me just before the start of the service, said, I've got a testimony to share, share with you about the 90-day challenge. Uh, as If you were here back in November, we issued a 90-day challenge to tithe for 90 days and see if the Lord doesn't provide for all of your needs, that he'll make that 90% go further than the 100%. And there's been several testimonies, and, and also for the Daniel fast. And we want to we gather some of these. So if you have a testimony, will you email that to me? Just something God's done, much like the testimony that was shared to me this morning about now that they're tithing, how God's honoring that. Or maybe it's through this Daniel fast that we're breaking today, that we've seen God do amazing things. But understand this. In Daniel's 21-day fast, where he saw the power of God displayed was after the 21 days. Guys, the best is yet to come. Look to the Lord. Look for his salvation. I also want to mention that a women's uh, a retreat is coming up. Uh, my wife, Robin, heads that up. And so they're, they're going to be going to Pigeon Forge. She says it's because of the speakers and musicians. I think it's because of the malls. But that's a topic for home discussions. But hey, ladies, it's in April. It's a great time to be fed spiritually. You get away, uh, have a great time together, a great way to meet other people in the church fellowship. And now it's not until April the 12th, but you need to start getting numbers now because hotels, a lot of hotels are already booked up and, and she's already reserved some hotels and some spots. So I think it's only like maybe the first 40 women the registered are we guaranteed a spot. So if you would, my wife, the information table at the back, sign up uh, for that. Uh, another announcement sent in the bulletin. Uh, for those of you that made contributions to Emmanuel in 2012, you can go in the church office, which is directly outside of uh, this auditorium and through the doors in the, the rooms next to the auditorium, and you can get your contribution sheet. If you don't want to pick it up today, we're going to be mailing them out tomorrow. But some have asked if they could just come by and pick them up, and you can do that today if you'd like. Lastly, we got a video clip we're going to show, and after the video clip, uh, you can respond to 
the women's banquet by signing up and back. That's what the video clip's going to be about. And then after the video, our, our deacon uh, will come and close us in a word of prayer. So if I could direct your attentions to the screen. One last announcement. Men, I know what you've been thinking. What am I going to do for my lady friend for Valentine's Day? We got a little something for you. Valentine's Day banquet, it's a popular event every year here at Emmanuel. It's February the 10th, 5.30 p.m. Don't you show up at the a.m. now. That'd be a little awkward. Man, I want to go to the Valentine's Banquet, but I don't have a date. Hmm, what is this? ChristianMingle.com? Hello. Name? Vernon Peters. Height? Mm, I'm only 5'5". Five, five. Six one sounds better. What is your body type? Pushing 300 pounds. I have washboard abs. Let's go with that. Occupation. Well, work at Pepsi. But ladies love professional bull fighters. How at you, boy? Man, this profile is definitely going to give me a date. Show. One more thing, I forgot to mention this earlier. This Valentine's Day banquet, it's not a sit-down guy and girl dinner. And so, if you can't find a significant other to bring, it's no big deal. Because men, you're going to be serving the ladies. Vern, it's okay. Don't forget to come by and greet these that have made decisions this morning. Um, also, Andy Kersey is the Deacon of the Week, so refer to your um, bulletin on that. And um, again, any prayers, petitions, any needs that you have this week, don't hesitate to call either him or any of the deacons in the body. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just thankful to be here in your house this morning. Lord, we're just humbled uh, by who you are and what you are in our lives. Lord, we're just thankful that you're our advocate and that you stand in the gap for us and that you, Lord, as you say in your word, that you fight for us. Lord, just go with us and be with us in all that we do today. Bless our families. Continue to bless our church and our ministers. And I pray for each and every one that's here in attendance that you just bless them and give them a special day. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>